you. Is that wine? Wait, where? Where? No. I, no, 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 no. <laughs> Is this, can, okay, you can hear me? I forgot my glasses down there. I thought it was wine. <laughs> oh. Puppy's <laughs> doing that Catholic thing. Oh my God, that would be Woo! Hi, Angela. I love you. I love you. <laughs> okay. I'm nervous. So let's start. Let's hap what's okay. happen. What's happening? Hey, well, good evening to all of y'all. Good evening to you, Mr. Kemp. And Arnold, it's just such a pleasure to get to share the stage with you finally for this well deserved focus on your work as an artist. But of course, you also had such a distinguished career as a teacher, an administrator, a writer, as we've heard in that beautiful introduction, and a curator. So I wonder if we might start, given this range of of uh, your practice, if you could start by saying a bit about how you see these various roles as related or not to your performative and object-based praxis. Um, thanks, QE, and thanks, CAA, for inviting me, and thanks, Sheila, for warming up the room, because <laughs> sh I, I do have to say, uh, I, uh, Sheila's like my, she's my friend, but like my mentor also has really uh, given me invaluable in advice. And Sheila's wife, too, who I met when I was curating at the Yerba mm. Buena Center for the Arts. And Sheila's wife used to be part of a collaborative called Dyke Action Machine. But I, can, I want to just go back a little further in yeah. answering that question. So um, I, it's funny. I spent a lot of time in Boston also. And I, I ran my own artist space as a young artist and, and showed other artists there. And I, I chose not to pay my, all the students here, you might want to listen to this or not, but I didn't pay my final school bill. And I took the money and I moved to San Francisco. Okay. And I didn't... I don't know what I was, I didn't know what I was doing. And was they still taking, gave you your walking papers and your degree? Oh, uh, they, they did. Okay. But, you know, they kept that transcript for a while. <laughs> so, <laughs> schools will do that, they'll keep that transcript. Okay, so, I didn't know what I was doing, um, but I walked into a nonprofit artist space called New Langton Arts. Mm -hmm. And there was an exhibition called Situations, which was the first sort of survey of gay lesbian art. Um, huge show, um, lots of names that are known now that weren't so known then. Um, I walked into that space and I, I definitely thought I wanted to work there. Mm. It's not like I could just walk in out of Boston and get this job at this super hot place. So my first three months in San Francisco, I was jobless and uh, pretty much homeless, just couch surfing. I did eventually manage to get a job at New Langton Arts. Mm. Um, there used to be a group in San Francisco called Pomo Afro Homos. Yes. Postmodern, modern, postmodern African American homosexuals. Mm -hmm. That's what it stood for. So um, <laughs> one of them, Brian Freeman, worked at New Langton and he like his career was taking off, so he left. And I got his job. Oh my goodness. Um, and when I was working at New Langton, I met and got to work with Daniel Joseph Martinez, Naylan mm. Blake, Adrian Piper. I, I did a lot of things at Langton. Every, eventually, everyone else who worked there either quit or got fired, and I did everything there for a little bit. Mm. And then I started knocking at the door of a new institution that was just opening in San Francisco called the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and I managed to get a job as an assistant in the curatorial department and I was working part-time for the curator of visual arts and part-time mm. for the curator of performing arts and they split me on the weekends um, in that time though you know my so when are you making work <laughs> well this you know I'm just trying to like establish a base yeah in San Francisco I was making work uh, but 
I was working my way up at Yerba Buena. Ver mm. You know, I was there for 10 years. By the time I left, I was an associate curator. I was curating my own shows. Curators from around the country were calling, asking my advice about things. But I was busy making my work. I had five solo shows in the 10 years there, um, especially at mm. other nonprofit institutions around um, San Francisco. A lot of spaces started by artists to support artists, mm. and those were very important spaces to me that are still important now. Those are the spaces, I think, where my work gets out into the world. Um, but being at Yerba Buena, you know, I worked with Fred Wilson and David Hammonds, uh, Ellen Gallagher, Leila Ali, so many people, more people. I work with Catherine Dunham and Philip Glass. Wow. Oh Not many people know it. Yeah. I knew Catherine Dunham. Mm. But it was like grad school. It was grad school before I, I attended grad school. Mm. It was just like sort of the Baldessari method of, I'm going to bring all these cool people for you, and you're going to learn about how they operate in the world. Yes. Um, and so, so that, that is sort of answering your question a little bit about the many things I'm doing having, a, ha having an effect, because I think that I was associating myself through Yerba Buena with people who, whose work was mostly on the conceptual edge, on the political edge, people who were thinking about multiculturalism, mm -hmm. um, queer identities, um, racial identity, um, and also working in, in many mediums, from mm, performance mm -hmm. to performing arts to uh, literature to objects and, and painting and drawing. Yeah. You know, even an artist I was working with at Yerba Buena came to me one day and said, you should quit your job. You should go get your MFA. You're a really great artist. And I, I had, um, I had, after, Curating many successful shows, I had proposed to my bosses that we do a show of the paintings of Joni Mitchell, mm. not Joan Mitchell. <laughs> and I'm like, this is going to be a blockbuster, right? And they just said no. And I thought, OK, guys. What are Joni Mitchell's paintings like? If you've ever looked at her album covers, those are her, that's all of her artwork oh. on the cover of all of those records. She's a super prolific artist, and she says that when she's depressed, she writes the music, and when she's happy, she makes the paintings. Mm. And so she's an obsessive maker, and there's a lot of really um, kind of crazy sort of self-portraiture, mm. pictures of paintings of Charles Mingus. And lately I discovered that Joni Mitchell used to, in the 70s, um, when she did that record called Don Juan's Rest Restless Daughter, Reckless Daughter, on the cover of that album is a, a, a very thin black man, looks like a blues musician or jazz musician. That's Joni Mitchell in blackface and drag. What? So she also had this performative persona mm. where we, she would show up at Hollywood parties dressed as Don Juan. Right. <laughs> this character who I think she based on Mingus. Mm. Anyway, we could, I didn't mean to go so deeply into that. But anyway, no. they Please. said no, and I said, well, I quit. I'm going to get my MFA yeah. if I'm going to be a if I'm going to be poor, I said I'd rather be a poor artist than a poor curator. So yeah. that. <laughs> and so it seems like for you that these other activities were not only your way of engaging, meeting with artists, educating yourself, and informing your practice, but also nourishing for the practice. Oh, def definitely. Meeting people like Betty Starr, David Hammonds, Carrie Mae Weems, Fred Wilson, who went in and out of different projects that I had curated mm. at Yerba Buena. Even Fred Wilson first told me about you and Krista. Oh, wow. When I don't know when it was, but Fred came back from Northwestern and said to me, you really need to meet Huey Copeland. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's lovely. And I mean, I guess maybe that, uh, I mean, I love what you said in terms of, you know, Mitchell making this division between, you know, when I'm depressed, I do the music, and when I'm happy, I do the paintings. Is there a similar kind of, like, affective logic for you that you need to be in a certain kind of space in order to get, in, get into the studio and to be making work that is different from the kind of writing an essay or figuring out an administrative structure? When I was younger, I mean, I was always writing and always making art, and for a long time they couldn't, I could not do both at the same time. I mean, I was mm. looking at people like Lorna Simpson or Glenn Lagon and uh, I would try to make sort of text image work that was just terrible. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I can't do it. I need to write sometimes, I need to make work sometimes, I, like art work sometimes. I wasn't going to choose one or the other, mm. <clears throat> but for a long time I just couldn't bring uh, sort of image text together. And the other work I was doing, sort of administrative curatorial work, I guess I could compartmentalize that mm. as just my job mm. in the world. And um, so it wasn't, working at Yerba Buena I wasn't actively seeking education, but I know it was educational, right? Yes. And I also was very ethical about not promoting my own work mm. as an artist. Mm -hmm. you know, at some point at Yerba Buena, I got a phone call from Thelma Golden, and Thelma said, I'm doing this big show, I don't know the West Coast artists, could you recommend some people to me? And I recommended... Everybody John... but yourself? Hmm? Everybody but yourself? Everybody. <laughs> Mark Bradford, Edgar Arsenault, John Bankston, David Huffman, all these people who were in freestyle. And then Thelma called me one day and she said, I was talking to Mark Bradford and he told me you're an artist. Arnold, why didn't you ever tell me that? And I just said, I thought that was unethical mm. because you know me and relied on me as a curator. Mm. And I just didn't feel it was right to promote myself, but I really have to thank Mark Bradford yeah. because he promoted me to Thelma and then I was in freestyle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. of course. And that led to a lot of things. So I mean, in a way, I mean, you've occupied all these kind of different roles um, in your life and in your practice, and it's clear that you sort of maintain certain kinds of divisions between them as befits those roles and your sort of ethical relationship to them. But in your practice, there's also a certain kind of multiplicity, but this is, you know, incredible promiscuity, both in terms of the materials, the media you engage, it's drawing, it's painting, it's costume, it's performance, it's installation, it's writing, it's sculpture that we've talked, as we talked about. Um, so I wonder if you could maybe say a bit about um, your approach to these kinds of promiscuous deployments of materials, particularly like aluminum, and their subsequent remediation as they appear in different forms across your practice and over time. Okay. So I think of my practice, I've been thinking about it recently as itinerant, mm. which I think is different than fugitive. Mm, mm -hmm. Like I'm obviously interested in fugitive materials, things that might disappear, that, that are not about conservation, um, but you know, things that relate to disappearance, right? Of mm -hmm. black bodies maybe. <clears throat> but, this, you know, Boston, New York, Portland, Oregon, Richmond, Virginia, Paris, and now Chicago. And as I'm moving to different places, taking advantage of materials or um, processes that seem close at hand, mm. um, like a lot of the, the work uh, the sculptural work I, I ended up making in Portland was because there was this person who fabricated like metal gates mm. down the like to between my job mm. and where I lived. Um, <clears throat> I think this also because I've moved around a lot, uh, a certain kind of portability that I had have tried to have in the work, but. 
wow, this is a performance I organized for you. <laughs> <laughs> They're a little early. <laughs> It's like when I saw Abby Lincoln once, she's like, and they had a salsa band playing under her, and she said, salsa, the story of my life. <laughs> it's like, this is like when I lived across the street from a cemetery in Richmond, Virginia, where there were 19,000 Confederate soldiers buried there, two US presidents and the US president. This is just like that. Okay. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, so this sort of I, it. Yeah, this sort of itinerant practice yes. and, and grabbing what's at hand, like like being in Richmond surrounded by ghosts. Yes. You know, and then I after making work that was sort of about the ghostly, about sort of mirrors that don't reflect back at you with sort of black paintings mm. that I was making in Paris, I started to use more reflective materials like aluminum foil and thinking about how to make mirrors, whether they were mm. real mirrors or things that approximate mirrors, whether they were broken or whole, that whether they're giving back a reflection of you or not. Or when I say mm. you, uh, I'm, you know, open. Uh, that's not, when I say you, it's not like you or me, right. but about whoever is being beheld by the artwork yes. while they're also looking at the artwork. Um, so much of my work is about looking and is about seeing uh, because I have, I have thought a lot about identity mm, and mm -hmm. this whole idea about visuality has been very important in my work. So while the materials are moving, there are some like conceptual touch points that yes. I keep going back to. Yeah, no, that's really helpful and it's, I mean, it's, a, it's such a useful distinction to think about the itinerant versus the nomadic or the fugitive or the errant, right? Because it sort of underlines the way in which a certain kind of itinerancy is part and parcel in many ways of what it means to be a successful working artist today and being able to sort of understand that and to incorporate that into the sort of operative logic of the practice seems to be a really way of, productive way of engaging with these kinds of necessities for movement but not at the same time, you know, being trapped by them, which I feel like artists often can feel when they're kind of on the residency circuit, right? Mm -hmm, so it's, you're making mm -hmm. itinerant work, not residence work. Yeah, right. it's funny because residencies don't work for me. They do not work for mm. my practice. I don't know what to do there except to, you know, write a grant application. <laughs> <laughs> which I have done and been a little <laughs> successful at that. Um, but, re uh, you know, I, I need a, a sort of a home space, even if it's moving around. And mm. I, um, you know, I didn't really have a formal studio until two, maybe 2009. My first solo show, which was 75 drawings and two sculptures and one photographic collage were entirely made in my bedroom, wow. you know, in those mm, days mm -hmm. when, in, in San Francisco, you know, when I was like living with a mom and her 18 year old daughter, wow. when we weren't doing like crazy family things, we were, I was like in my room drawing. Mm. You know. I mean, that's such, so interesting because I remember um, having a conversation with Jenny Jones about her earlier practice, and she was like, my early work was all in the kitchen, right? It was right. all being sort of made in the kitchen. But then, you know, once she had a certain degree of success and was able to work and have her own studio and bigger spaces, there was a scalar shift that happened in her work. She was like, for the first time, I could make something big and have enough space to be able to step back and look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and so now that you're sort of working more in the kind of space of a studio, has that sort of shifted the scale of the work in any way? Or like the sort of physical ambitions that you have for it since you're not sort of constrained by a kind of smaller working environment? Well, I guess I have, you know, it's one of my constraints is a rule I made very early on that I would make, I would only make things that I could move myself, mm. right? But. I've, I've expanded, I've made some things now that I can't move by myself. Um, and having a space to store things as well as make things has made the, the studio uh, really important. 
Yeah, I don't know if I have much more of an answer to that, yeah. but I'm, I'm actually working a lot right now, and the work is really expanding it in scale and also in sort of the number of iterations mm. of, of different types of imagery I'm working with, whether it's printmaking or photography or, or painting or yeah. sculpture right now. Yeah, fantastic.